Uh, Brickett is ready to go. Good luck. Thanks. Your presentation. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, we're Brickett, and we, that's me, Maggie, and Boots, my colleague in the audience. And today, we're going to show you what a day at cabling would look like if they were using the Brickett collaboration platform, or I was taught not to say collaboration, but cooperation platform. Um, so, for the sake of this demo, we have picked three cabling employees, and we're going to follow them through their mornings. We picked Anne McLear, the head of internal communications, John McChief, the CEO, and Ricardo Silva, a factory worker from Portugal. All right, let's get started. Anne McLear comes into the office around 8.30 in the morning, and the first thing she does after grabbing a cup of coffee is log into cabling.bricket.com or CBC, as everyone is, um, else at Cabling really says. The first thing she does in the morning is quickly browse um, the homepage to see if there is any new content since last time she logged in. Quickly thereafter, she checks her notifications to see if anyone has commented on her blog posts or questions or um, project pages, or maybe if someone had mentioned her in meeting notes. She's got a couple of notifications today, so let's have a look at them. Her first notification is from Phil McPlan, who has assigned a task to her. Let's check out the page containing the task to get the full picture. So we're looking at meeting notes here from a meeting last Friday that John McChief had with Phil McPlan about the upcoming factory or opening in Turkey. She sees the task assigned to her um, from Phil McPlan, asking her to start drafting a communications plan for the factory opening. She also reads how in past openings, a few things went wrong communication-wise. Unfortunately, Phil doesn't mention any details. All right, Anne's got work to do. She decides to create a page in the marketing space for her communications plan, using a template that she had already created for communication strategy like this one. She quickly fills in the blanks. And decides to restrict this page to the management group so that John McChief and Phil McPlan know that progress is being made before she unrestricts the page to a wider audience. Now, if Anne wants to get this right, she really needs to find out what exactly went wrong with past factory openings, and she wants to browse CBC to find information. She decides to go to the Bratislava page to see what happened with the Slovakia factory opening. She notices how the factory in Slovakia was opened in 2013, and thinks that chances are someone documented the lessons they learned during that opening. She quickly browses the meeting notes, and in fact, finds notes from a retrospective meeting. She notices how quite a few managers have att attended this meeting back in 2014. And she reads how Elise McGeek mentions that quite a few things could have been improved communication-wise. For example, employees in Portugal were afraid they were going to replace them with cheap labor from Slovakia. And they were lacking general understanding of why a new factory needed to be opened. This is good information, Anne thinks, so she copies the notes and goes back to her communications plan to paste them in there so she doesn't forget about it and has everything in one place. As she reads those notes over and over again, she has an idea. She decides to create a task for John McChief to start writing a blog post about the reasons behind the factory opening in Turkey reassuring Slovakia and Portugal employees that their jobs are safe. And thinks that this is going to make a huge difference compared to the last factory opening. Now she wants to find out more about the factory opening in Portugal, so she browses to the Setubal page. Here she learns that the factory was opened in 2001. She can't find meeting notes that go that far back in time, so she decides to search for Portugal factory opening. She's wondering whether CBC existed back in 2001, and while she browses the results, figures there's no page that goes that far back. 
So what does Anne do? She decides to ask the cabling community a question. She wants to know who was involved in the Setubal opening back in 2001. She quickly elaborates on her question and tasks her question with the topic Portugal, knowing that all employees, or most employees in the Portugal factory, are watching this topic and will get notified of her question. Now, Anne wants to go an extra step, really reaching out to the right people. So she goes to the Portugal topic and finds that Joseph and Sam McCable have accrued quite some credit points answering questions in the Portugal topic. So she decides to go back to her question and at mention them to get their attention. But she's got another idea. See, Anne is full of good ideas. She browses the employee directory to see if she can find someone who actually works in the Portugal uh, location. She doesn't need anyone from the UK, but here we go, Ricardo Silva works in Setubal, and look at that, he's been working there since 2001. So he must be someone that can help. She at mentions Ricardo as well, and now it's just a matter of time until someone gets back to her with input. Let's hope it will be helpful. On to her next notification. Someone commented on the press release she's been working on last week. Looks like it was filmic plan, so let's have a look at that. When she goes to her press release, she notices how a few things are highlighted here. When she clicks on the highlight, she sees an inline comment from filmic plan pointing out a typo. She quickly edits the page to reflect that this isn't the 35th factory, but the fourth factory that Cablink is opening. Now that she has corrected her mistake, she can reply to Phil McPlan's comment and assure him that the mistake was fixed. She resolves his comment, and now she can move on to the next one. Phil wants to know what ends means in this context and whether it's common practice to write ends after a press release, which Anne confirms. Now she can resolve this comment as well and move on to the final comment from Phil, who wants her to double check a phone number of the contact person. She quickly replies that she had already checked that and that the phone number is definitely correct. So now it looks like she's already all set and um, can send this press release out to the press. But Anne wants, to have, um, wants John McChief to have a final look at this press release. So, so she decides to share this page with John McChief, asking him to have a final look at it. Now this is what a regular morning looks like for Anne, and she stirred up quite a few cable linkers with her communications plan, her at mentions, and comments. So let's have a look at how they react to that. John McChief, as most cabling employees, comes in around nine in the morning. The first thing he does is log in to CBC. He does that even before checking his email because there's very little internal communication happening since everyone's religiously using their internet to communicate. He checks his notifications and sees that Anne has already started working on her communications plan. He's curious, so he goes to the page. He has a quick look at it and thinks it's looking promising, so he leaves a quick comment, reminding her to also check, oops, reminding her to also check with contractors and agencies. When he likes her page, he sees the task that she has assigned to him, asking him to highlight the reasons behind the factory opening in Turkey in a blog post. John thinks that's a great idea because he remembers that there was quite a, some tension coming from the Portugal employees when they were opening the Bratislava plant. So he decides to create a page for the blog post. He actually doesn't want to write the whole blog post himself because he really doesn't have the time, so he restricts viewing to himself and Anne because he's going to just make a few notes and ask Anne to write the actual blog post. He gives it a title, 
a few headlines. Now he can save the page. And share the page with Anne, asking her to make this a proper blog post. Now on to his next notification. The next notification is from Anne as well, asking him to have a look at the press release she was working on. He has a look at the press release, reads quickly through it, and is satisfied with the content. But he's got one concern. Anne is not going to send this page out to the press, but a PDF. And because there's quite a few special characters involved in this press release, he decides to make a quick note asking her to upload the final PDF she's going to send out to the press so that he can have a look at it and check for special characters displaying nicely. Now, to make Anne's life easier, he decides to upload a template press release PDF to the page. That will give Anne some guidance, and when she comes back to the page, she'll be able to have a quick look at what press releases at Cabling usually look like. Now, John has gotten quite some work done, all without sending any emails or attending any meetings. But let's have a look at how Cabling employees who don't have computers and work in factories use the tool. So we're going to follow Ricardo Silva through his morning, but before we do that, let's have a quick look at his profile page to see what Ricardo is all about. When we look at Ricardo's profile page, we can guess that he really likes surfing. We also read that he lives in Amadora, a small town close to Lisbon, and that he takes the train to Setubal, where the Portugal plant is located, every morning. He t tells us that he uses the time to chat with his colleagues and to check uh, news on CBC using his mobile. But let's stop talking about Ricardo behind his back and actually watch him go to work. Ricardo has received a notification email from Anne because remember, she had mentioned him in a question. In the notification email, he finds a link prompting him to log into CBC. When he does that, he sees the question from Anne asking him about the factory opening in uh, Setubal back in 2001, a time he vividly remembers. He remembers how this was his first year and how it was kind of crazy. So he starts writing an answer drawing her attention to the fact that um, the production line was stalled for two weeks because they hadn't found suppliers on time. Also reminding her that um, language barriers and time zone differences were causing quite some trouble in the first few months. He upvotes her question so that he, she gets more visibility. Ricardo has mixed feelings about this factory opening in Turkey. He thinks that the Portugal plant has been humming in along nicely, and he doesn't really see why they need to open a new factory. He'd prefer that they hire more people in Portugal. So as every morning, he browses the news space to see what's new at Cabling, and he sees a blog post called Why We Need a New Factory in Turkey. So that definitely has his attention. He sees how this blog post was written by John McChief himself and he learns about the booming market in the Middle East and the need for a factory closer to countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. He also learns that the new factory will be more sustainable while reducing the cost for production, and is being reassured by the CEO himself that Bratislava and Setubal employees will continue to play an important role at cabling. That makes him feel a little better about the factory opening in Turkey, but now he really has to log out because his train has arrived in Setuba and he needs to go to work. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro, Agnes, Bruno, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so I noticed that you have a hosted solution, is that right? What are the requirements for a company to be able to deploy it in their servers? Um, you probably need a server, <laughs> a database, and someone who manages the application okay, and maintains it. 
but do you suggest any type of database or can it just be a MySQL or a Postgres database? It doesn't Postgres matter. Postgres is probably a good option. Oracle, um, MySQL is also an option. So you're ba you have abstracted the database from the software? Um, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> okay. So first and foremost, congratulations on a very nice presentation. It was really easy to follow and to understand your concept and ideas. Um, if I understood correctly, this is a wiki based based on Confluence, right? It's uh, the base tool. Um, and there's such, I mean, Confluence has pros and cons, and you adopt some of them, and you corrected a lot of them. I like the way that you integrated chat into the documentation, so that's quite important to establish collaboration or cooperation, whatever was the discussion that was there this morning. Um, one thing that I, I, I find it puzzling is the wiki. The wiki requires a lot of effort, organizational-wise. Not everyone thinks the same way, so the templates actually do help. But the question is, who's in charge at the end of the day? Who maintains the information architecture? Who makes sure that everybody knows where, where, where to write and where to put the documents? So there is an additional over, overhead that requires from using a wiki. I use one very successfully uh, within a team, and it's really great. Um, but it does require everybody to start working for the tool as well. Um, so what we've seen here in another different tools that actually do a lot of tasks for us, the wiki essentially relies on people to do a lot of things for the structure. Um, so I would actually like to know from your experience, what is the, the deployment uh, uh, overhead? So how much effort does organizations need to put into this? Because I know you can start from a wiki from a very simple one, but that's probably not, not the best uh, startup case. Yeah. So maybe you want to comment on that? Yeah, good question. Um, so I guess the... Um most important thing for organizations to think about is how do they map the features of the tool onto their organizational structure? Um, do I need a space for marketing or do I need a subspace for internal comms and marketing? And so our solution involves a few services where we help you define and help you create templates and layouts and that kind of stuff. Um, you can certainly do that yourself, but the base package includes consulting services from us. How does, the, the, how does it integrate with the current, well, for, with the other systems, like um, whatever you have, SAP, SharePoint? So there's a SharePoint connector, which is an add-on that you can just add on to the tool. And um, as uh, it was mentioned before, um, this solution is based on Atlassian Confluence. So we're an Atlassian partner building on top of this existing solution. And so as many of you may know or not know, there is a huge ecosystem with um, vendors um, building plugins to facilitate integration with Evernote, Salesforce, SharePoint, you name it. Um, yeah, most of, some of them are already built in, like um, integrations with Jira and Issue Tracker, for example, and some you can either um, add with free or paid add-ons. I must say that I was really observed with your story, <laughs> and uh, I'm almost not having a question. <laughs> that was my plan. <laughs> Congratulations on that one. <laughs> Any other questions from the panelists? If not, open no. the floor to the okay. audience. Audience. Lewis, others? How scalable is it? How stable? It's scalable. Scalable. Can an organization of four, five hundred thousand employees use it without crushing it? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So um, there's, we offer a solution called Data Center, which is um, a high availability and performance um, solution for organizations that really have mission critical setups and that need to have an available um, internet or whatever you want to call it at any time and who are in different locations and they can't afford downtime. So that includes load balancing and that kind of stuff. Sorry, I guess I was, I guess I was asking how does it handle the complexity of hundreds of thousands of iterations every single day? Because I know that Confluence is relatively weak at that point, right? <laughs> in terms of large, massive corporations. That's what I'm talking about. Well, large, massive organizations are using that tool. Siemens, Nike, Apple, Pixar, they're all using this solution. Um, and so 
um, they must be doing something right. Um, Performance-wise, it's a matter of allocating the right resources to the application, increasing the memory, and yeah, that is something that we can definitely help with as a services company, uh, help you identify where you need to increase or lower um, uh, resources. Other questions? I saw something pop up on Twitter and somebody b uh, nudged me about it. Uh just before we went into, uh, back into the program, uh, saying uh, last year, every single vendor got the price question. And this year, we have a three pre uh, presentation, nobody asking the price question. That's because the economy is better now, right? <laughs> Money, you know, who cares? No, but, but, oh, it's all for free. Uh, Hans Jürgen thought it was all for free. No. But, but could you say something about the pricing scheme? Sure. So let's say that Cablelink is using a hosted solution and that they're using the full um, package, including design and services and all that kind of stuff. And so that would be, for an organization of roughly 2,000 users, that would be $5 per user a month. Okay. Or Cablelink is actually 1,200, right? So that would be a little more because the price for the solution, including the hosting and everything, um, is 120K annually. Not annually for the first year, it's 120K. Right, right. And, and that comes with a Confluence license? That comes with all the software pieces. Confluence yeah. is not the only software that we were showing here. We right. were also adding our own add-ons and other add-ons from third-party yeah. vendors. Yeah, uh, that's the complete passion. Okay. Any other questions for Brickett?